this is the third series in the third year indeed of the laureateship of podcasts that I have made with some of my fellow writers in which I ask what the hell stroke heaven it is that we do. Not expecting or even needing an answer, but in not getting an answer, maybe some signpost directions towards an answer. I really hope you enjoy them. Today is my great joy in prospect of talking to Danielle McLaughlin, who is who is certifiably, and uh, this is universally acknowledged, one of the great short story writers, one of the great living short story writers in the world. And she she's won many prizes, which, while which can be characterized as a bit of fun, but also can indicate excellence sometimes. Um, in particular, re quite recently, the Sunday Times Short Story Award, which is a um, highly coveted award, and the Wyndon Campbell Prize, uh, which is given uh, on sort, as it were, from America. So I'm not the only person is it, to notice her genius, but when I read her book in that first Innocence, um, I was genuinely overwhelmed and delighted. And um, this is her only book so far, short stories, Dinosaurs on Other Planets. And she has a, she has a, a novel coming next year from John Murray, as yet untitled. Uh, so, Danielle McLaughlin. This is um, a story called Not Oleanders from Dinosaurs on Other Planets. Uh, and it's right at the end. You have been called the master of the end. I don't know what that means, but uh, you certainly do know how to end a story. Um, and the protagonist is coming back to the the kind of pension or refugio, she calls it, and doesn't want to be seen approaching the building because she has done something that she doesn't want the owner of this place, Alessandro, to know she's done. Isn't that what it is, more or less? Uh, if you can remember your own story, which isn't required. And if you could just read those, the last two paragraphs there, She found a track that led back out to the meadow, but at a different point to where she'd entered earlier. There was a breeze, and the grass rippled in a sea of dark greens, light greens and silvers. She could see a little distance away the refugio and someone, Alexandro, she presumed, doing something with a ladder on the terrace. Further uphill, half a dozen horses were grazing. The last film she and Sandra had seen together was set in medieval France, where horses kitted out for war. Huge apoc apocalyptic horses in the king's colours had galloped in a regal charge through cobbled streets, sweat glistening on their flanks. These horses were nothing like that. Most were not horses at all, but shaggy ponies. Possibly one or two were donkeys. Seemingly as one, they raised their heads from the grass and stared. The intent with which they regarded her was touching, as was the graveness with which they stood to attention, as if they had been waiting, as if her emergence from the woods had summoned them to a different, nobler calling. She returned their gaze, keeping still, very still, even the in and out of her breathing as quiet as possible. Then she realized they were not looking at her, but past her. A figure was making his way up the hillside, a bucket in his hand. He came a little way up before halting and putting down the bucket. He cupped his hands around his mouth and began to call. The horses broke into a trot, then a canter. Then they were barreling downhill, 
their unkempt manes flying, their tails streaming out behind them. The slope brought its own momentum, and they were galloping now, neighing and snorting and whinnying. They thundered past, trampling on daisies, forget-me-nots, buttercups. And as they went by, she stepped back into the trees to shelter from the clouds of yellow dust flung up by the chaos of their hooves. That's so beautiful. I'm, I'm tempted to break into a spontaneous panegyric like that. Um, because it is, it is very tremendous work, but we'll, uh, I'll say that in my introduction better. Um, something about that donkey, for instance. Also that man coming up and the, prefer the horse is noticing that and it's not her. Everything, everything about that is um, impossible to put your finger on what it means, but mm -hmm. it all means something tremendous. And it's a, one of your stories set away in, in an away as worrying really as your Ireland. <laughs> Uh, or maybe your characters bring their worry with them. I, I mentioned before we began, um, I quoted to you a poem by uh, Ezra Pound. He has another poem, I think using a comment by Dante, I'm sure, Siena mi fe disfeca mi marema. Siena made me, marema undid me. I, is there a town or a city or a place that made you and hopefully also slightly undid you. Do you have a home place? My home place where I live now is that same place where I grew up. So mm. I live in a small rural parish, Dunmore mm. in North Cork. Mm. And when I was... How dangerous. When I was about <laughs> 17, I moved into um, Cork City and shared flats there for some years and I spent a year in Waterford and a few years in Dublin but then I moved back to Cork again so I live now just a couple of fields over from the house where I grew up so very much came back. Do you know I we found a house accidentally that was a gallop away from my great aunt's house in the Wicklow Mountains her cottage where I had been safe and happy as a child we homed to that point. I, I mean, I have three kids and um, I always felt the greatest thing I could do, having been through my version of childhood, the greatest thing you could do for your children is actually give them a sense of safety. I have a suspicion though that maybe one of the marks of the writer is that they didn't always feel entirely safe as children for whatever reason. Would you say you had a, was childhood a refuge for you? Were you content and good there? I had a very happy childhood in the sense that I had very good, caring parents and yeah. I lived in a safe parish. Um, I was an extraordinarily fearful and anxious child. So often I lived I a lot know. in my head and my head was often for no objective reason was um, a very terrible, frightening place. So I would have been brought by my parents um, to a psychiatrist, for example, back maybe in the late 70s when that didn't tend to, age, to happen as much. Maybe 10, I'm guessing, oh, that kind of... It's unusual. It, it would have been unusual. And, you know, fair play to my parents for yes, spotting that, right, yeah. okay, there was something not quite right here with the level of fear and... Um, anxiety that that I the, had. The one thing I, I, you know, I shouldn't be solace to hear you say that, but I am sort of because, you know, the one thing I have tried to, my own personal battle has been with that very thing, anxiety, which, um, which is a curse because it turns even wonderful things into mm -hmm. fearful things. And it can truly poison the well. And you, you know, you do want your water to be clear and clean as you draw it with your bucket. Um, but you say for no reason, mm -hmm. did the wise person, did they bring you to a lady or a man? It was to a man, yeah. Was I, he a famous psychiatrist or? 
Um, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I do um, remember asking, I think, you know, in, when I was an adult, um, if there was any report or papers, I think, because I was interested yes. in maybe in writing um, something about yes, that time, like... but I don't think there's anything there. I th- I don't think he made any diagnosis of there being anything mm. wrong with me. So they just uh, brought you out of care, mm-hmm. you know, yes. and all power to their elbows for doing that. Yeah. So now I have a sort of vision of your mother and father somehow in their 70s coats. So I was, I was, I was born in 1955, so the 70s does seem quite recent. But anyway, let's, let's pretend it's long ago. And they're bringing their 10-year-old child. Because one of my questions, as you may know from the little template I sent you, is being, is, is being a writer all the mammy is doing? Some people, Tom Kilroy preferred to talk about his father. He would hardly say a word about his mother. Um, I, 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 I have to acknowledge that my mother somehow wangled it with the gods that I would end up a writer, for better or for worse. But do you have, when you think about that, do you, do you see... Do you see either of your parents or both of them making you in any way? I see them as um, always having valued books and education, I think. Mm. Um, And we would always have had books in the house when I was a child and I loved reading. So that was maybe my... Library book? um, They would have bought a a lot of books for us. We had library books as well. And... When I think back, my parents weren't wealthy. They had um, very, very little money when we were Where were young. they buying their books? Um, yeah, I don't know how they <laughs> managed to find. Would they the come in the post? Or? No, I, hmm, I don't, I don't know. Do you know, because you say it's a quite a small district. You're yeah, in. it would have been Cork City. Um, so um, maybe once a week, um, my parents would go to Cork City oh, yeah. to buy the groceries and. Do you know we're now being there. detectives of? their actions but that's good isn't it because you wonder how did those books arrive in the house so what do you think would have been the obsessions of your mother the different obsessions of your mother and father reading wise what did your mother read I would have um, been given books that had belonged to my mother to read Mm. and they would have been out of Green Gables Ah, she would read them little um, well, she gave them to me when I was young, so oh, maybe right. they were from her from, from her, her childhood. childhood. And actually, I have a book at home on my bookshelves that's a copy of Faulkner, um, and that was my mother's book. Um, like what the sound the of print, the print is too small for me to read it by myself <laughs> now. It was a book that was it's a closed kept. book now. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think... Um, Maybe my mother would have been a bigger reader than my father in those years, but my father reads an awful lot now. Now, what does now, he read? Um, all kinds of things, okay. fiction mainly. Yeah. Are there any origin stories about yourself that you remember like that? Is there any signal thing you did as a child that that you carry as a kind of uh, early book in in the old, in your Old Testament? I don't think so. No. I don't. Um, Did you never do something terrible as a child or have some scrape with mortality? or? No, I don't think I was much of a doer as a child. I think mm. I was very much in my own head mm. a lot of the time. Mm. And there was a whole world in there that was quite a scary place. Um, mm. There is a conception of the writer. Since, since our overarching thing for what we're doing is, you know, what the hell, stroke mm-hmm. heaven, are we doing? Could you conceive still, that even without having to say you still have an anxiety in the world, that, that you work in order to, to extend the light of the fire, as it were, to, to enfold the people listening, as well as yourself, your listeners, oftentimes children, of course, to stories, that you're 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 creating, you're dispelling anxiety. Would, would that be a mad idea? Um, no, I think they're 
could well be something there. I do think that in a way, writing is partly a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. And I think it may be something to do with control and wanting to feel in control because mm. certainly I would think that I, pr I prefer written word mm -hmm. to spoken word or conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with words, you can put them down on the page and there they are and you can look at them mm -hmm. and keep an eye on them. Mm -hmm. So I think there is an idea of control. Like and, and so that is maybe about... Um, calming down the anxiety but feeling a little bit more in control of the words so you're the a story. shepherd of those and words and i think you know spoken words and conversation they it you know it floats about it's it's noise that's what, so, you know not in a derogatory mm -hmm. sense but it is noise whereas so i like to see you know with words you can manage really them. urgent important level you're compensating at a certain level for it is your stratagem. It's your your answer, you know, as a grown person to the necessity as much as, as often as you can to dispel the feeling of not being in control. Yeah, and at the same time, the I know that we can't really, in a way, control any of the important things in life. We're just, yeah. you know, we're just there and things. There are things that happen and we have no control. But okay. I do... Since we have to you know, function in the world, I yes. think writing Since is a obliged. preferred way of functioning mm. for me than other forms of so communication. So you say something, you know, which in itself is quite devastating, but it is true. We, we are obliged to be in the world. Mm -hmm. yes. <clears throat> that carries a lot with it. Um, and you, you prefer the written word. Yes. And we are... If we are storytellers, I always hear Colm to be and say, I'm not a story. But anyway, if we are storytellers, he seems to hate that word for some reason, but um, we do write them down. So we're those people who write things down. So even though you dislike the idea of oral words floating around, nevertheless, we are in some curious way the Homeric beneficiaries of these long, long decades of not writing things down. Yes. Do, you, do you acknowledge that? Yeah, abs absolutely. Oh, thank and God. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, and I suppose my preference for the written word, it's, it comes because not because I don't see the greatness and all the wonderful parts of the spoken word. It's because mm. I kind of understand that I can't really do the spoken word or the conversation mm. side as... Um, comfortably as I'd feel mm. communicating on a page. So it's almost like I feel um, it's more I'm going to the writing for a refuge, you know, because that's a place where I feel I can function more confidently. I, I'm with, the, you know, the, the, the forest native brought down into the holding camps and being photographed and feeling that they were dead now because their soul had been taken. I, I, I see that. I mean, even talking to, you know, one of the nicest people I know for the Guardian the other day, afterwards I thought, I would rather have said nothing at all. Yeah. And the other thing is, you start saying things that you didn't know you knew about yourself. Yes, absolutely. And so you betray yourself, or it feels like betrayal. And yet in our work, that's when the manuscript is burning with life. When you've reached something in the sentences that is somehow not more than you intended, but was inevitably there, but only by that sequence of utterance that comes before. That they're what I call lucky pages. That's what I asked you to read the about the horses. Because you've done a bit more almost than you needed to, because something has come in as a consequence almost of your spiritual indiscretion. Would you accept that? Um, I think there's probably lots of stuff floating around in that package and that in that passage that um, I read. I'm not too sure myself what is there. Mm. Um, I do know that there was a different ending involving those horses uh -huh. in that story before. And it was going to be a happy ending where I had 
my woman running downhill with the horses. Oh, no, but that didn't work. So, um, so she didn't get that happy ending. She mm. is in the trees um, undercover watching them go by her. Yeah. But isn't she happier not being happy? Uh, <laughs> she's safer. She, may, she is Happiness safe. was very she bad for that safer. woman. She is safer. Yeah, she's... Um, I mean, she's lost her love. She mistakes the actions of, of a woman she yes. really thinks is beautiful and yes. goes all the way to see her and realizes, oh, no, no, it, that she didn't put her phone number on the book. That's actually her mother's book and that's her mother's phone number. I mean, it is. Yeah, I think Just it's awful. it's a humiliation and she's hiding from that. She's in no mood for happiness at the end of that story. Yeah. yeah. Many, many things will have to happen before she gets to that. <laughs> You know. Yeah, I am, um, maybe in the last 12 months or so, as I write, I'm mm. trying to write with um, more of an openness to, mm. to happiness and not sliding down into a default of misery or so you, unhappiness. You, sort of I don't know how that's going to work well, out. Well, you're confirming my deepest suspicion. I mean, everything you're talking about could be spoken by me <laughs> or not spoken, but... Because these are, this is where we we are, as this thing called writers doing this thing called writing, which we we give names to. As Plato said, as soon as you name something, its essence put, pulls back into the darkness, like like the lady in the trees. You know, you, you, you yeah. it, it, it's removed from you. You must have found this often as a solicitor, that even as you name the remedy, you've somehow maybe prevented, I, maybe that's just a wild guess, but do you know that it's difficult to proceed with language? That's why the law tries to make language so precise. Yes. But is our business to make language precise or is it to let, to let the language go within the confines of a field, but as if there is a sort of joyousness in the horses, in sentences, when they hear, see the man with the bucket? Are, yeah, well, um, are we allowed? That? I haven't thought of it that way, but no. yeah, I kind of like it because there's yeah. happiness there for someone, isn't it? It's just yeah. that it's for the horses. Yeah, why not? And, and, but they're getting their happiness out of a very um, ordinary, everyday thing. It's food, mm. it's filling their belly, is what's going to make them happy. But you only um, have to look at a horse to see that there is there is some yeah. crazy god inside that, mm. in that head, isn't it? Yeah. Extraordinary heads of horses. What potent friends they seem to be. I'm always quite shocked when somebody tells you what your book is about. Because um, the whole point of it was it, it was all the things you didn't know. Yeah. Now, that's a paradox, but yeah. the following of your sentences. I mean, isn't it true that the joy of of pursuing your sentences, leading up, leading to these things, is because you actually you, you you're you're on horseback. You're fully girded. You're you have your sandwiches, and you have, but but you don't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. You can't even see the track very clearly. You're not even sure if there is a track. There may be a vast precipice just around the corner. You're not quite sure. That's the not knowing, isn't it? Could you define the the urgency or the importance of that? I think ignorance, really. Yeah, I think I don't know because there is the idea that we have this momentum taking us towards something that we don't know what it is or where we're going. And mm. I think of writing as maybe being a kind of obsession or mm -hmm. compulsion, mm -hmm. and I think I regard it in that way part because that's my personality so mm. when I was say a child and I had lots of very very fearful obsessions and mm -hmm. compulsions um, I actually think that maybe that obsessiveness and that compulsive part of my personality has just taken writing now and writing is kind of where that obsessive energy gets streamed because if I think about it you know I didn't have a word of fiction published until I was into my 40s so mm. what was I doing you know where were all the stories and writings 
before that for that first 40 years because it became kind well, of all, all consuming. So I'm just wondering if I feel a bit like, you know, someone who took their first drink at 40 and immediately became yes. an alcoholic. And that, no, that, not having drunk that at was a particular sort there. of person in the countryside too. The teetotaler mm-hmm. who suddenly starts. Yes. My grandfather specialized in noting those people because he had just drunk his entire life. <laughs> fallen teetotalers. So you're a fallen yeah. teetotaler basically. Yeah. And now you're just a wretched word drunkard and it's all yeah. over. <laughs> Uh, thank God. Um, well, that's a huge thing for you. I mean, in my understanding of you, that looms. It's like the the president's cut into the cliff of the black, sacred Black Hills. Um, the Daniel McLaughlin story, in a way, that you had this other life as a solicitor, which sounds so wise much wiser than being a writer. And I know you had a very challenging time of illness, which if I was shaping it as a story would be obviously a very important part of this changeover. Yeah, well, I do think if I hadn't got ill, I might not have written Mm. the book. Did it change you, do you think? I think it did. Um, I think when I got ill, my career went at the same time very quickly because I was too ill to work and had to transfer all my clients to another firm. So I kind of think there was like a psychological undoing when that yeah. happened and my, my work was gone and I was sick and I had, I suppose, up to that point, and maybe it had to do with aging as well and how we tend to maybe see the world differently as we grow older, but I had never understood the concept of um, can't until I got sick. You know, I always mm. thought, yes, you can do it, and people can do things. If and your babies and were how how old when? They were maybe um, I think they were six, four, and two maybe when I got ill. I mean, that's age. that's a full physical ultra athletic job in itself, isn't it? Yeah. Too? It, this is something I suppose I've only started thinking about this after I wrote a book. The, the idea that having written a book, there is now some sort of record of my existence. Um, something there. in turn to be stolen. Whereas I would never have thought about that before. Um, yeah. What, what do you feel, because we, we, we won't talk for too much longer, but what do you think about the fact, Danielle, that we've had this particular language for maybe 150 years in our families. I think there's probably things lost with the Irish language that will always leave a gap. Leave a gap. I think there are things that we knew in the Irish language that are there maybe in some sort of genetic memory and we now don't know the names for them. So there is some, there's something that we feel at some level that we don't have the words for. I used to write some very bad poetry as a teenager uh-huh, uh-huh. and I um, kept a notebook where I had some of those poems mm-hmm. written. Mm-hmm. I was looking at it recently. Oh, you didn't throw that out. I well didn't done. throw that out. And there was a poem that I had written in English about how I wanted to write a poem in Irish, basically. So it was a poem about my sense that I needed to write something in Irish but knew that I never would, which was the feeling in this. Uh, I wanted to ask you many more things. I wanted to ask you about the economy of writers. Uh, We just probably don't have time to do that. And maybe that's a mercy, because how can we speak of money when that's even more mysterious than writing? (laughs) And I want to thank you, Danielle. This has been, in as far far as such experiences are available to the human creature, a sublime experience. I really, really thank you for coming. Oh, thank, well, thank you. It's been great having the conversation and has got so many things started in my brain, I think. Let's shake on that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>